You know, one thing that our accountant told us, this is pretty dry and boring, but mm-hmm. once your rate, always your rate. If somebody is trying to beat you up, I feel like our studio rates are very reasonable and they try to get you to give them a deal, right? And you give them a deal and then guess what? They're going to tell their friend what price they paid and that friend's going to tell another friend and it's a very small community here. So once you come off of it, it's very hard to come back up. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, FreeSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Hey rock stars, it's your host Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Yoli Mara who, along with her husband, Chris Mara, manages the Nashville Analog Focus recording studio, Welcome to 1979, located in what used to be a thriving record pressing plant in the nation's area of Nashville. Welcome to 1979 is a spacious recording studio that specializes in analog recording at a time when most studios are 100% digital. The style of the studio embraces the look and feel of the 1970s with a fully restored MCI JH428 console and multiple MCI tape machines. The office space even has a vintage look with an overstuffed leather office chair and classic handheld red rotary telephone. Both Chris Mara and Cameron Henry have been previous guests on the podcast, and you can hear their stories on episode 27 and 35. Yoli also helps to manage three other businesses there the successful tape machine restoration business, Mara Machines, shipping and restoring tape machines worldwide, a vinyl mastering and lacquer cutting service operated by Cameron Henry, and a newly added electroplating facility allowing you to expedite the vinyl pressing process for your next record release with impressively fast turnaround results. Welcome to 1979 has an impressive client list that includes Pete Townsend, Third Man Records, Jason Isbell, Lady Antebellum, Reed Shippen, Margot Price, Rodney Crowell, Pam Tillis, Chris Stapleton, John Prine, and Luther Dickinson. And that's just reading the first 11 names or so off the website. (laughs) Yoli also manages the very successful and super fun annual recording summit in November, where people come from all over to attend a weekend of live to disc performances, expert panels, and listening parties of classic records with world-class engineers and producers. And rock stars, you should definitely check this out. It's early um, that they tend to sell out well in advance. So make sure you check that out and uh, see if you can come on down to the next one. You'll love it. Yolo is also a mom of two, an active fundraiser for the local community. And today I want to learn as much as we can about what it takes to run a successful studio and business and what it means to grow from a small studio into a global industry. Please welcome Yoli Mara to Recording Studio Rockstars. Yoli, are you ready to rock? You bet. Awesome. Welcome to the Toy Box Studio. Thank you so much for coming and doing this with us. Thanks for having me, Lidge. Um, you've done a lot of stuff. You guys have built and grown a studio. We were talking about this before the interview that that I remember, you know, 
right at the very beginning of the studio, even receiving emails from Chris and being really impressed that he was sort of, you know, had built an email list and was doing this. He was just really making an effort to um, kind of create a business and, and market and reach out to people and, and share the story of making records and stuff. And now you guys are doing all kinds of stuff, four businesses there. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about uh, your beginning with this stuff. Did you start out being interested in recording music at all or, or tell us, you know, how you got it? into all this? Um, sure. I actually have had, um, prior to running the studio, really no interest in recording. Um, <laughs> um, I've always been a fan of music, but as far as the technical side of things, it's just really not my thing. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, so Chris had been a freelance engineer here in town for as long as we had lived here and kind of decided he was ready to have his own space. So we opened the studio and um, the studio had been open for about two years and I was um, currently teaching full time. Um, we had, you know, an infant and a toddler <laughs> and um, they were coming to work with me. We had on-site daycare. So the kids and I were gone from, say, 7 a.m. <laughs> to 4 p.m. And he was gone from 10 a.m. till God knows what time. Right. Um, so we just weren't seeing each other and it wasn't working for know, our family. I know that feeling. <laughs> um, so my summer break came around in the summer of 2010. And all of a sudden, right, the kids and I were at home and we saw him in the morning before he went to work. And, you know, he could help more with the kids and be with them. And um, we both take credit for the idea. But <laughs> I think it was my idea that I was like, hey. Maybe I could quit my job, stay home with the kids, right? We would drop our daycare costs. We sold one of our cars because we live, you know, a mile and a half <laughs> from the studio. Yeah. Um, and just, I just did whatever I could when the kids were taking naps or in bed or whatever um, to help with invoicing and just, you know, like email or emails, mailers, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And um, it just really kind of worked. Um so I just did as much as I could of the behind the scenes stuff and took that off Chris's plate so he could focus more on engineering and uh, the booking side of things, meeting with bands, getting them to come in and that kind of stuff. And um, it very quickly paid for itself and made That's sense great. and worked. And as the kids got older, obviously I could do more and more. And then once they were both in school full time is really when I was kind of more on site at the studio every day. and. Um, I've just kind of seen my my role in the studio grow as my as my kids have grown and I've been more available. But you know, let me ask you a couple of questions mm -hmm. about the um, the different stages of that. So yeah, you know, at the beginning, you guys are uh, raising a family. Chris is making records. You're working at the same time. He suggests, uh, you know, I think a lot of us who have been through family and and doing this kind of crazy world of recording music have seen some version of that. Um, what do you remember about the initial decision, like, I want to open a studio? What were some of the challenges um, and decisions that you guys had to make about, you know, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? You know, because there, there are people, uh, rock stars who are listening now are thinking about mm -hmm. the same thing. It's like, yeah. you know, should I, you know, I got a young uh, family with young kids, mm -hmm. want to do the studio thing. What do, what do you feel like you remember about that decision-making process and stuff that was, uh, that you learned? Um, well, when he just decided that he wanted to look into it. Um, he had already acquired a lot of gear. So over the 10 or 15 years that he'd been engineering, he had racks of gear already that he was using cartage to move all over town. Um, he had a 24 track tape machine <laughs> already. So we kind of had this garage <laughs> full yeah. of equipment. Um, so the only major purchase we really, I think he even had speakers anyway. So the only major purchase we had to make was a console. Um, so we looked at it in kind of a use what you've got situation. Um, so we didn't take on a lot of debt. Mm -hmm. We found um, we really just lucked into our location. Like Chris would just drive around and, <laughs> and look for places that were not far from us that had the space for rent and um, the building that we're still in now. Yeah, it's such um, a great space. Do you want to describe the building to the rock stars real quick? Yeah, absolutely. The building itself is actually about 30,000 square feet. And um, as we've grown, we now take up about 12,000 square feet of the building. Um, but when we started out, we took the front part. So the building was um, originally built as a record pressing plant in the 50s. Um, so the space that the studio itself occupies 
um, was originally, there's a downstairs area with a huge live room. Um, and if you look at the wall, you can see where there were dividers. Like it was definitely like a bunch of small offices in there. So they were never really using it as a recording space. Not down initially. there. Now yeah. they, the, um, the control room upstairs, I believe with mastering room. Okay. So they did mastering and that kind of stuff on site there. Um, well, it was such a clever use for you guys of saying, you know, here's this, well, first of all, it's 30, uh, Rockstar, did you, I don't know if that went by quickly, but she said 30,000 feet. So <laughs> 30,000 feet is massive. I mean, mm -hmm. like you look at that and you're like, oh my God, what are we going to do with this? Do we have to like build it out for millions of dollars right. into studio space? Mm -hmm. But you guys were very clever about it and said, now let's just use these existing rooms and mm -hmm. wire them together. Um, and, you know, the control room is above the recording space. And mm -hmm. you can, so you can kind of come down the stairs to come in, you know, move a mic, which I think is really smart, actually. My studios have always had some some sort of stairs in it. I think you get more exercise yeah. <laughs> if you're doing that. There's a slide now too. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, wait, <laughs> tell us about the slide. What, what's that all about? Um, you know, we're always just looking to do something kind of fun and different. And um, we actually had been on a brewery tour in Asheville, North Carolina, at New Belgium. And on the tour, there's actually a slide that you go down, and we're like, Holding wait your a full minute. Beer. What's you that? have to hold your full beer and You're not, not allowed to take it down. So you have to drink your beer and then go down the slide. And yeah, then they give you another too. one at the bottom. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and I think that sort of planted the seeds. So it was actually January of last year, 2018, <laughs> um, that Chris just bought like a playground slide. It's like a little twisty tornado one. And um, it um, you just get in right behind the control room upstairs and it comes down into what used to be office space and is now an artist lounge. So, you know, you this is of course, out right down. You find this, of course, on the Facebook um, playground buy and sell group, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think it was an eBay <laughs> purchase no, or something. But, yeah, but, true. You found it on eBay. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, so, you know, and again, it's like take this huge space. Don't be overwhelmed yeah. by the concept of what a studio could be and just. Right. Move into the space that's available mm -hmm. and then grow it from there, which you guys have done. Yeah. Um, and then also listening to what you said about, you know, not taking on a, a huge amount of debt. Do you remember feeling like you were willing to take on some debt, that that was an important part of a decision to start a studio? Or, um, you know, do, if you were starting a studio again today, would you be like, yeah, well, I would totally consider debt for a, a way to start it? Or would you be inclined to say, I would, I would just start with what we got and, and just build it and grow it from there. Any, any just advice on that? You know, there's a little bit of a catch 22 in it. Um, the way that we did it worked for us at that time. Um, and since then, really anytime things were going smoothly and we had extra money, he would just add gear, microphones, um, you know, a microphone monitoring system and that kind of stuff. Um, so he's constantly upgrading it and adding stuff. Um, the kicker about it is, let's say somebody recorded at our studio seven or eight years ago, they're going to remember the way it was then right. and not necessarily be aware. They may be like, oh, I didn't really like the headphone boxes there and not know that we've built it and upgraded it. Well, I'm glad um, you brought that up. How do you let um, clients know about the upgrades and the new stuff? And um, We have really active social media accounts. Um, we're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, so we try to blast stuff out um, via those a lot. Um, and then we use, you know, just MailChimp to do, we have pretty large mailing lists for email. Uh, so we try to get it out there as well. And then um, really having the events like the Recording Summit, which I know we're going to touch on later, yeah. but just having events and reasons for people to get through the door again when they're not booking a recording session, mm -hmm. you know, where they can come by and see what's new and, you know. Yeah, you guys have always been really smart about having parties and listening yeah. parties and stuff mm -hmm. like that, where it's like, um, but I think you just have people get together to just listen to records and drink beer and hang out, right? Yeah, yeah. We do all kinds of, just really any excuse, you know. We did uh, well, a slide warming party last year. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, let's dig into some of the details on that. And, and you know, it's 2019, so we really can't avoid talking about social media and email. Yeah. So we will talk about that a little bit, too. Well, let's talk about the fun stuff first. Throwing parties. Um, what are some of the things that the rock stars should be thinking about if they're like, yeah, I want to, you know, I got my studio, I'm in this location and I need to get build awareness and get people over here. Mm -hmm. um, what are some smart ways to throw a party and what are some dumb ways to throw a party? <laughs> 
Um, I think smart ways are to kind of think about who you want to get through the door and make sure you're getting the message out to the right people. Um, we've never really had problems with, you know, theft or, you know, <laughs> people misbehaving at our parties has never really been a part, a problem, but you know, you have to be careful who you're marketing it to and yeah. and how you're staffed during your party um, and that kind of thing. But, I, I remember having some parties here and sometimes noticing and going like, when I have a party, is it just all my friends that are coming over right, to right. it as opposed to, you know, people to make records with? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we've taken some interesting angles because you're right. You get your friends over, right? And they've all been there before. Um, so we try to make it something interesting, unique, whether it's a direct to disc recording, like we did for the anniversary party, something that people really want to see that they're not necessarily going to see somewhere else. Um, and that kind of gets people through the door and, um, also surprising ways to make connections. You know, the nation's neighborhood where we're at has blown up, you know, since we started out there and there's tons and tons of musicians and recording engineers in the neighborhood. So we've actually become um, active in the Neighborhood Association meet meetings and have had, you know, mixers for neighbors over there and just kind of oh, made them aware cool. of our presence and that kind of stuff. So that's smart. really using all your resources. And then, of course, you guys are in a commercial space. So yeah. you guys started a studio as a commercial studio in a commercial space. Right. I know a lot of our listeners have home studios mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, one of the things when you talk about like doing the live to disc thing and trying to attract, you know, the, the right people to an event or a party, I think about, you know, you have the option to <clears throat> invite a particular band or client to come and play or perform or do something. And maybe that's a smart way to be tapping into that, where it's like, instead of, instead of it's about the studio, sometimes it's about the, you know, the, the artists that mm -hmm. might work at the studio. Yep. Absolutely. Um, you guys also do a really clever thing too, where there'd be like a coat check. You know, if you if you bring a beer with you, you do a coat check. <laughs> yeah. Any good uh, tips on that idea? Um, that was actually my creation. So um, our parties are quite often BYOB, um, and a long time ago we had a BYOB party, and I had brought like three bottles of wine, thinking that other people would drink it or whatever, and feeling generous. And I had like one glass of wine and I stepped away from my bottles and, you know, an hour later I come back and it's completely gone. <laughs> I was like, all right, we need a solution for this. So, yeah, so we have an intern at a bar and we have coolers full of ice and you, you bring your beer or your wine or whatever you're drinking for the night and you check it in there and you get a little ticket and you just keep bringing it back until all your drinks are gone and, you know, awesome. somebody else isn't going to swipe it. So. I love clever <laughs> ideas like that. Um what about listening parties? You guys do listening parties too. Do you mm -hmm. have, um, and have you learned some smart ways to invite people to come and bring their music that they're working on and play it and share it for everybody? Is that is that one of the things that you guys do? Um, you know, Chris has done some like, um, he doesn't like to call them shootouts. I'm trying to think of what he calls them. But where he invites people to bring maybe something they've worked Show on. Show and tell maybe. Yeah. To run it through maybe a couple of different pieces of equipment and compare it or, you know, uh, hit it to tape smart. and that kind of stuff. What so, a smart yeah. way to like introduce everybody to the new gear that you've got yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. It's like bringing yep. music and listen to how good it sounds through mm -hmm. it. Yeah. This is why I love doing this podcast. We just get to <laughs> come up with stuff like that. Um, okay, cool. Uh, any other kinds of uh, parties or events that I'm not knowing to ask about stuff that you've discovered or something you, you know, you want to try or that got excited about? Um... Oh, well, we do the tape camps. Um, well, yeah. Tell us about the tape camps. Yeah. I didn't mention that in the beginning. Yeah. No. Um, so twice a year, we do an event called tape camp. And um, it's a two or three days. There's a couple of options. But it's a weekend long recording workshop about recording to tape. Um, so on Saturday and Sunday, they Saturday, I think they bring an acoustic artist um, and actually record. Um, we limit it to 10 people. So it's a pretty smallish group. Um, and they all get to rotate doing different roles and they set up. So in the morning they come up with a plan and they all get involved and set up and microphone placement and all that kind of stuff. And then they take turns being tape up and that kind of stuff. They learn how to, you know, splice tape and do all that. 
And then there's an optional add-on day on Monday where he does only five or six people where they do actual um, tape machine alignment for a whole day. That's very cool. Um, and then I know Chris, at least in the past, has traveled to other cities mm-hmm. to do a tape camp too. Does that still go on? You know, it's something that we haven't been doing. He is actually talking to a uh, studio in Iceland about one in wow. June <laughs> up That's there, great. which is, you know, a little bit random. But um, but yeah, it was, it was a little bit more difficult to make them work in other cities in the U.S. because studio rental became cost prohibitive. Right, right. Yeah, um, and it made the... Yeah, made the cost of entry more expensive. It's obviously a lot cheaper to run it at our own studio. Um, And then would you have a band in the studio? I think you just said this, but you'd you'd invite a band in and record them to tape as part of the process of a weekend like that? Yep, they do an acoustic artist on Saturday, and then they do a full band on Sunday afternoon. So what's a smart tip to the rock stars about um, inviting a band in for some kind of event that they want to do in their studio? Do bands typically go you know, hell yeah, I'd be happy to come in and record for, you know, get a free recording for a day. Mm -hmm. Or is this something more complex where you have to really, um, you know, consider hiring a band to come in? Uh, Just any thoughts about that sort of thing? Um, We've never actually had to hire somebody. Um, And they do, I think they do just two songs. Um, And so typically we reach out to bands who maybe have been flirting with recording at the studio and right. maybe this is a way for them to get their toe in the water, See, super get smart. a couple of songs done and then maybe come back and finish it up or mix something with us or, you know, so um, they can kind of get something done for free and get an idea if they like the studio or I not. I think that's so, great. I love stuff yeah. like that. Um, you know, we were doing something called stereo sessions here for a while where it was invite bands and have them come and the bands would videotape each other. Mm-hmm. So we'd make videos of live performances. Oh, but, okay. Everybody who's at the party gets to participate in the creation of whatever you're doing. So I I, I love ideas where you're you you know you figure out how to bring people to the place, figure out how how it all works, and it's really smart what you said about making sure that you're not just throwing a party for a party, but you're thinking about like who are you trying to invite to your studio mm-hmm. and what's you know how does that all work? How are you how are you helping them? Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that I feel like I've really been educated in the concept of business is understanding that we're in a service industry Mm -hmm. and you really have to always think about when you want to do something, how is this going to help somebody else? Right. Um, Do you want to share any thoughts about that? And is there like a, you know, about your thought process on that or or stuff you've learned? Um, hmm. Do you remember a time where you had a great, what you thought was a great idea and then later you're like, nobody cared at all about it as a business (laughs) move? (laughs) I feel like that happens a lot. I feel like we try to be really creative and just throw stuff out there. I'm trying to think of something specific, but quite often we'll be like, wow, this sounds super cool. And then nobody shows up or. Well, that's encouraging to hear because. Really you know, work. <laughs> so, sometimes from our perspective, we can look like you guys just would hit home runs every right. time, you oh, know? Yeah. So I think it's encouraging to know that, um, like songwriting, maybe you have to uh, just try a bunch of stuff. And then the good ones are the ones that we hear about and the bad ones mm-hmm. nobody ever knew about. You know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, you throw um, stuff against the wall and still something until something sticks, right? Right, right. <laughs> and I guess that would go for parties and events. And I know you yeah. guys do a variety of things. Um, you know, probably uh, we got so much to talk about too. I want to talk to you about. Um, I want to talk to you about staff. I want to talk to you about. <laughs> um, you know, keep you know, bookkeeping, all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Um, all right. Well, I also like to ask guests to share an inspirational quote as we kick off the podcast. Have you got anything you'd like to start us off with? Get us excited. About- Either about recording or about running a recording studio? You know, that was a tough one for me. Not a big inspirational quote person, but um, I do this mother-daughter book club with my 10-year-old, and we read the book Wonder, which became a super popular movie this last year. But there's a quote in there. I don't remember who said it, but um, it's when given the choice between being right and being kind, choose kind. Nice. I'm a human being who really likes to be right. (laughs) And when you're dealing with customers, you have to really be able to let that go yeah. And cater to them, um, especially with the electroplating shop. You know, we have um, probably six pressing plants that are our primary customers. And so, you know, even if something is maybe not our fault, <laughs> you know, I really have to put that aside and say, OK, you know, yeah, I will do what I have to do to help you out and, you know, keep you moving forward. And- do, do you feel like you've ever noticed that it's easier to do that when you have, um, when your business is in a place where you're doing a lot of work with a lot of clients and it's much more challenging to 
have that attitude when you've, you know, when you're just starting out and you've got like your one thing that you're really counting on? Yes. I think it might be more important in that second case, right? Yeah. If you've got your one thing. <laughs> right. And more important to make yeah. sure that they're happy. Yeah. Exactly. That's good advice. exactly. Yeah. But probably harder to do. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. I, I think that that is a funny thing because I know for myself, there's certainly many bridges I've had to cross where, you know, the, the artist uh, or the client might want something. It might be a real pain in your ass mm -hmm. and you might feel like it's not really your fault. But again, you're like, you know, what's the end result here? Yeah. If the, if the end result is that they're very happy and they got a great result out of it, ultimately that's going to be much better for you as a business, right? Exactly. Um, okay. Um, what do we want to ask next? Um, let's talk about electroplating. Okay. Can you describe what that is to us? And, and, uh, I mean, you know, without getting into too much tech, uh, but just tell us what that company is and, uh, maybe you can describe what part of the, why do we need electroplating? That's what is it? Are we putting chrome on bumpers, on car bumpers? What are we doing? We are not. We are not. We could, we could, put nickel on a variety of things, but we're not doing that either. Um, but so we've been doing, as you mentioned, you did the podcast with Cameron, yeah, who does um, mastering for vinyl. Okay. So we've had the lathe to do the first step in the vinyl process for about six years now. Um, so we were cutting lacquers and shipping them elsewhere, pressing plants or other electroplating facilities. Um, so the next step after a lacquer is cut is the electroplating. Um, and so basically what that process does is there's all kinds of voodoo magic science that goes on. We have big electroplating baths. We have 10 baths. Um, and basically the lacquers go in there there's a nickel solution. It adheres to the lacquer. Um, you pull the nickel off and you have a stamper, which is basically the mold that goes, that is then shipped to a record pressing plant, goes into the press and vinyl is squished between the A side and the B side and you make your records. So, so the, <laughs> the the electroplating is the making of the stamper. It's like yes. the master that all the copies are going to made be made from, right? Yes. Yep. That's what I thought. I'm glad that I I'm glad that I thought that right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, the record making process can seem really confusing until yes. you you look at it a number of times or go through it yourself. I mm -hmm. think. I'm sure you've learned a ton about it that you never thought you'd ever have to know about. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, I could tell you a lot about electroplating. <laughs> um, and I remember touring some other electroplating uh, facilities. Maybe it was like United. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the one part of the record making process where I feel like I've stepped into like a, um, you know, like a dystopian uh, horror <laughs> video game where, you know, mad scientists are walking around with rubber aprons and stuff yeah. like that and giant gloves. But the, from looking at the photos of what you guys have built over there, it actually looks much more like a pleasant coffee shop environment. It's very, yeah. very nice and clean and, and beautiful. Yeah. So when we decided to go into that piece, so, um, you know, we got the lathe when we knew that vinyl was really on the track for a real resurgence. Um, and then we realized very quickly that the real bottleneck in the process, you know, turnaround times for plants were terrible. People were waiting three, four months yeah, to get their product. That. And it just, it was messy. Um, so only a handful of pressing plants have electroplating in-house. Um, all the rest of the pressing plants at that time were sending their, any lacquers for their jobs to only one other electroplating facility that was independent of any record pressing plants. Um, so we just saw an opportunity there to relieve that bottleneck and, you know, have some good business. Well, I like the idea of having it in-house like you do. Um, so, you know, an artist can come and from, you know, the point of pre-production all the way through to this is the master that's getting delivered right. to be printed. You know, they, they're they working in a, in a trusted location with you guys, mm -hmm. with trusted people. Um, you know, the idea of having to send something over here and then it goes over there exactly. and then it goes over there. It reminds me of trying to connect software on my Mac and my studio computer and like this doesn't work. And then they're like, well, you'll have to go talk to them. And then you go talk to them and they're like, well, you'll have to go talk to them. Exactly. And like, nobody wants to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty awesome. Um, uh, let's see, what what else do we want to know about? So I know you guys have tape machine 
restoration, Mara Machines. We do. Maybe, maybe talk about that too. Yeah. So Mara Machines. Um, so that really kind of started hand in hand with the studio. So when Chris opened the studio, he would get a lot of phone calls, people asking him, you know, who works on your tape machine? And he was like, I work on my tape machine. Sorry, I don't have a guy for you to call. And it was like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know. Um, so he did some work on some other people's tape machines and suddenly realized that, you know, people wanted to buy tape machines from him. So in the very beginning, we would, you know, you'll you'll understand a theme here of frugality, but we would take a deposit from somebody find a machine, buy it, get it back to Nashville, restore it, and then take their final payment and ship it to them. That's brilliant. So we started out without any overhead, right? We didn't buy a machine (laughs) till we knew we had an order for it. Um, And that went on for a few years. And Chris would just do it when the studio was slow or whatever. He would do the restoration himself. And then what we started doing was um, our assistant engineers, um, if there wasn't a session, they would work on tape machines. Um, which was great. So all of our assistants, and this is this is still how we run things, all of our assistants in the studio are very knowledgeable about tape machines. So if something goes wrong during a session, they're good at troubleshooting. They really know how it works and what's inside of it and all of that. Um, anyway, so we grew to the point where now, um, 10 years later, we buy every tape machine we can get our hands on. Um, we shipped 40 machines last year. Wow. Um, we do only MCIs. We do the JH24. And the JH110s from the uh, B's and C's. Rockstars, <laughs> we need to point out that Yoli is sitting right next to a JH16 <laughs> and next to the remote control and a JH110 mm-hmm. while she's telling us all this. So um, that's really so amazingly impressive. And I love hearing you describe, you know, from the business angle that initially you start smart where it's mm-hmm. like, take a deposit down, then go find the thing. Don't don't overcommit with, the, with your idea because when you overcommit, that can be the death of a business, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, it evolves to the point where yeah. you, you now you're in a place where you feel very comfortable buying the machines and yep. having them ready to go because yep. you know that you can turn them around. and. Yep. And, and we actually them. have, um, for about two years now, we have a full-time tech who runs the entire department. I still handle the, you know logistics and right. acquiring the machines and making <laughs> and the sure. And the, you know, yeah. Um, but we also, um, like I said, we only do MCIs. We warranty them for six months. And um, the only people who get access to our techs as far as for tech support are people who own MAR machines. So if you're a MAR machine owner, you're not waiting in line <laughs> behind somebody who bought a cheap one on eBay and wants us to, <laughs> to yeah, help them figure yeah. out how to make it work. Um, so we really push the customer service there and, you know, um, I'm sure pretty sure if I recall correctly that, uh, one of the credits on your list, Pete Townsend was a customer of Mara machines. So didn't he, didn't he get some Mara machines? Yeah. Pete has, I think he has four. Gosh, I don't even remember. He's bought in several, <laughs> in several stages of, you know, so he had some, um, at his place in England and then he wanted one, you know, for his vacation home in the South of France. So we shipped one there for him. Um, and he actually, um, when he was here on tour with The Who, stopped and recorded at the studio for a couple of days ah, because they so they had canceled jealous. a show somewhere else. They were in town early. So literally he called Chris and he was like, hey, is your studio available? And I was like, yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Sorry, kids. We're not going to school today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was That's really, that was awesome. really cool. What a great story. Yeah. Um, uh, talk a little bit about what a Mara machine looks like, because they don't look just like your everyday MCI. Right? <laughs> um, they don't. So they're fully, you know, top to bottom. They really just completely take them apart. They're really, really clean. Um, on the JH24s, the the um, head stack cover is painted a gold, not really bright color. Um, on the 110s, the deck plate is that color gold. We badge them with a Mara badge on the front. So they just look you know, as new as they can. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, uh, Do you already, can you, can you look forward? I know you don't have to look forward this far, but can you look (laughs) forward to when a Mara machine is vintage? (laughs) I mean, it's vintage to begin with, but But it's vintage, vintage. Is that vintage vintage squared? That is. Is What is that? Another, how old do you have to be to be vintage? (laughs) Another 10 years? Uh, (laughs) You know, I'm always surprised. It's not nearly as old as you think it is. I had um, an older version of Pro Tools in here. And I remember um, Pat Sansone came in. He was like, oh, rock, you're, you're rocking vintage because I hadn't like upgraded to the HD <laughs> system at that time. I was like, what? Yeah. This was brand new for me. 
Um, let's see what, um, I guess, you know, we've, we've been touching on some of this stuff, but I'll, I'll jump into some of the questions I've written down here too. Um, you know, what are thoughts that come to mind for you about the difference between running a small studio and a larger busy facility? One of them was, you know, don't overinvest. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some other first thoughts that come to mind? You know, you, you obviously have a lot of experience also with the recording summit because mm -hmm. you, you bring people together from all walks of, right. of, of uh, studio mm -hmm. life across the country and across the world, really. Mm -hmm. um, what do you feel like are differences between the small studio owner who's listening to this now and somebody who's running a commercial, a bigger, busier facility? Um, I think when you're running something small, you just have to understand how much of it is on you and <laughs> how all-encompassing you probably get this. Yeah. It's going to become for you and, you know, nobody else is ever going to care about it on the level that you do. Um, but on the flip side, you're not stressed out about, you know, we have one room, right? <laughs> so I'm not trying to fill four or five rooms or maybe get somebody, you know, to rent a mix room from me or that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's certainly more manageable. So do you feel like a small studio or do you feel like a larger, busy studio? I think of you guys as a larger, busy facility because you've got so many things going on. Well, I guess I compartmentalize them, you know? Um, so I think of the studio as its own very yeah. separate thing yeah. of a one room facility, you know, it does stay busy and, you know, we work, um, analog to digital transfers in, and the downtime and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, um, yeah, let's talk about that for just a sec. Cause I think mm -hmm. that's another clever use of a facility. So, um, this can go for any of you rock stars is probably, I, I think a good rule of thumb is to always assume that what you've got is being underused. Mm hmm and that you could be using it, getting a lot more out of it if you're running it as a business. Um, what are some clever ideas? Uh, I guess just maybe just talk about the one you were just talking about. Uh, you know, studio's not always booked with an artist in there, right. so but it doesn't mean it has to be quiet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we've always kind of worked on a multiple streams of income is important. Um, I feel like anybody you talk to in the studio business knows there's busy times and then it's going to slow down. And um, Mar Machines feels very much the same way. Now, Mar Machines has gotten busy enough that our busy times keep us busy <laughs> through so the slow time. So we'll get a whole bunch of orders like one month and not so many the next month, but we'll be piled up to work on them. But so you have to have a few things to balance each other out. Um, and so with Mar Machines... Um, we always have multiple formats of tape machines in house and, and paired with the studio. So uh, we've always been able to do a lot of different analog to digital transfers. Um, so, like you said, it's a good use of any sort of downtime. And um, we just take them in and give them a turnaround time and then look at the schedule and be like, okay, <laughs> who can do this when in between sessions? Or if it's a session that's not a super long day, can somebody stay late and do it? But it's super easy to work them in and, you know. Yeah. So it, if I'm listening here, it sounds like in order to work in those alternate uh, kind of in income streams for a studio, you just sort of have to, it, it's not very automatic. It's very like customized and personal, like somebody needs this other thing done yeah. and you have to just simply look at the schedule go like, there's time next week. I'll have it for you next week. It's not always like a guaranteed 24 hour. Right. Or, yep. So maybe yeah. that's part of balancing between those different uses of a space like that. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about, uh, you know, not when, when your studio grows and it's not just you. Mm -hmm. um, I've spoken to a lot of producers who talked about even struggling with just having an intern in the studio because they were like, I tried it and it didn't work or they didn't know uh, what they were doing or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I hear, I talk to people who, who talk about the struggle of, finding an assistant. How am I going to, I just have to, I'm the only one who knows how to do it right. Talk about what it means to find help. Okay. Because I, I, I think it's, it's important for us to begin with the premise that if you really want to grow what you're doing as a business, mm -hmm. you can't do everything yourself, right? Agreed. Yep. Right. It definitely is very challenging. Um, we get a lot of people reaching out to us for internships at the studio. Um, and so we do a pretty rigorous interview process with them to try to be sure they're the right fit. Um, we learn pretty quickly that kind of part of the problem of having 
um, a certain image online of being fun and cool that people don't realize how much work fun and cool is, you know, <laughs> that maybe we do fun, <laughs> cool things when we have a, a minute or whatever, but that, it's incredibly stressful to be relaxed, right? It, yeah, exactly. But, you know, to keep the place looking good and a place where people want to come to and uh, running smoothly, there actually is a lot of work involved, especially in a facility that big. And so we definitely had some interns who came in and just had no idea <laughs> what they were getting themselves yeah. into. Um, but, you know, you get to know some intern coordinators at school and, you know, they'll send you their best people and that kind of stuff. And as far as assistants go, almost every assistant we've ever had at the studio started out as an intern. Yeah. So um, we like to see an internship as a chance to kind of vet somebody <laughs> and make sure, you know, by the end of their internship, we pretty much know if they're assistant material or not. I've um, noticed that interns tend to um, present themselves to you. You don't have to work too hard to no, discover no, who's you really do good. Not, no, you know? yeah, absolutely. It comes through really pretty fast. Who's Who needs to be directed every minute of the day and who is just going to see what needs to get done. Sometimes do it's it. just who shows up. There's that too. Who's you know? on time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah. Um, Okay. So then what about the process? You know, you talked about like a vetting process or a rigorous application um, that could maybe stress somebody out who hasn't done that before. Like, oh my gosh, what are the perfect questions I need to ask? Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? How do you, how do you even come up with a, um, an application process when you're trying to hire somebody or have an intern or an assistant mm -hmm. or just any, you know, anybody who's going to work with you in your business? Um, well, specifically on the interns, um, a lot of the questions will focus on kind of where they see themselves going in their career, what they think they're going to do when they're done with an internship. Um, a big one is, are you planning on staying in Nashville? Because do we want to put the time and effort <laughs> into three months of somebody and have them take all those skills somewhere else if we're looking yeah. to build an assistant, um, that kind of thing. Um, so... Um, and then do you, I guess part of my question too is a little bit of a loaded question, but I imagine that in the beginning you didn't know all the right questions to no. ask, but now you know a lot of questions to ask. Yeah. Having done it a number of times. Mm -hmm. Um, what about other things? Um, I've had experience trying to have somebody help out or assist, you know, hire an assistant for a particular task. And sometimes I feel like I've learned that 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 person I'm hiring from within that really just wants to be a musician or a producer or an engineer. <laughs> and I, and I'm hoping that they'll want to do this kind of mundane task for, for hire, but mm -hmm. that doesn't always work. Yeah. Do you, do you run into that? And have you learned any lessons about, you know, if you need somebody who really just is going to be do an excellent thorough job about putting um, notes in a spreadsheet, you know, <laughs> how do you find that person? Um, well, part of it is, like I said, that question of like, where do you see yourself going immediately after your internship or right now? And if somebody tells me they're going to be a producer, like the day they graduate from college, it's a little bit like, okay, you're, you're not the right person. But there seem to be people who understand that kind of middle piece of you have to do some of that work, put information in spreadsheets, and then maybe opportunities will present themselves. You know, um, we actually have somebody working for us right now. She interned with us. She was great. Um, I actually, right after she finished her intern, it was recording summit time. And I was like, hey, can you just help me? Like literally she put names on all the name badges and broke them apart and put them in the sleeves and just all that like stuff that nobody wants to do. But um, I used to have a hard time asking people to do that. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, if they're not doing it, I'm doing it. Right, <laughs> Is right. that how my time needs to be spent? Um, you know, I wound up doing it in front of the TV at 10 p.m. Um, anyway, so I just feel like there are certain people and you figure it out pretty fast that are willing to do that and understand that it's an opportunity maybe to grow into something else in the studio down the road. Like maybe we don't have an assistant engineer position, um, you know, or maybe there's not something full time. But if they just keep that foot in the door and show that they're a good worker and are willing to do these things that, you know, that there's growth. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a good reminder to know that sometimes putting names in name tags is 
the step along the way to having a studio that lets you make the amazingly produced record that you want to make. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't put the names in the name tags, you may not have the studio to make that record with. Yeah. You know? uh, for me, having interns in the studio, um, you know, I started a process of making videos of things that I was teaching them. So we started building a library of like mm. how to do things in mm-hmm. the studio. And that that really helped. In fact, I even got the interns. We just did one just before this. So new intern um, inter, uh, shot a video of me explaining how to set up all the microphones for a podcast interview. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they'll put, then he'll put it up. And, and uh, when the intern puts it up on the channel, it's like they're building, helping you build the library. But one of the things that of course was the challenge was, um, you know, for me, I'm a small enough studio that that getting the bathroom clean. There's no hired help to do the bathroom cleaning. You nope. know, we clean it ourselves. And when an intern didn't really understand or or thought that sounded like some lowly job, it's like, here you go, shoot a video of me cleaning the bathroom <laughs> really well. So when anybody sees that video, nobody's going to claim that you know, it's it's a job beneath them. I mean, I'm doing it myself, and all you're doing is helping us make a better record. If I don't have to do it right this second, <laughs> oh my god, Lige, I'm totally doing that now. You should do that. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. So let's let me look for some more good questions, okay. uh, or at least hopefully some good questions, right? Um, Let's dig into, we talked about staff. Let's talk more about the social media and email aspect. Okay. It, like I said, it's 20, 000, uh, 2019. Mm-hmm. We can't get away from it. We yeah. got to talk about this stuff. Um, what is it? What is MailChimp? <laughs> MailChimp is just, um, it's a website and it organizes lists for you. So you build your own mailing list. So we have a Mara Machines one. We have a studio one. We have a recording summit and tape camp one. So you can customize your audience for it. And it builds like super professional looking, you know, newsletters that go out. So it doesn't look like I just sent out a, hey, the recording summit's coming up. You know, it's got graphics and logos and pictures and, you know, cool formatting. Yeah. And links to all your socials and your website on the bottom. And, you know, and it's super easy to use. It's like drag and drop, you know. Yeah. Um, So I don't Um, know how many people really read them, but. I read them. That's how I, that's how I first saw Chris's emails. Um, so uh, Rockstar's, I'll tell the story a little bit more. Um, Chris was sending out an email about recording in a barn up in Wisconsin mm-hmm. and he had gone off to do a weekend thing. And this popped up in my, my email and I was just like, that is so cool. I was like, I actually yeah. asked, as I was re- remembering, I asked Chris out for coffee so mm-hmm. I could just talk to him like, what's an email service? You know, how did you do that? Yeah. How did you send an email like that? It was really mm-hmm. cool. Um, so I think that stuff's important. But what about growing an email list? Um, you know, in the online world, I, uh, for an online business, I have a lot of things that I've learned. But for a recording studio, do you have a strategy? Is there Are there smart ways to get more names and emails on an email list so you can connect with people? Um, you know, Chris handles that part a lot more than I do. Um, but I think a lot of times he adds people just as they reach out to him about recording. Um we have an online form for people interested in Mara machines. So anytime somebody fills that out, they get on the Mara machines yeah, mailing list. Yeah. So you do really have to be very vigilant right, about so it or kind you're going to forget. Kind of an organic process yeah. too, yeah. Yeah. You know, and they make buttons. You can put them on your website to be like, you know, sign up for our newsletter. Right. Um, and we're actually going out to NAM next week in Anaheim. And um, – it's our, we did Summer Nam here for the first time, which is much smaller than the one out in Anaheim. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll be at Nam with you guys. I'll see you there. Yeah. Yeah. We'll stop um, by the booth. So, yeah. So, one of our main goals is we feel like, you know, you talk to so many people in an event like that. So, um, before we leave, our objective is how do we capture <laughs> more of their contact information versus, you know, we certainly won't remember their names after yeah. <laughs> after four days or, you know, have yeah. their contact information. So um, we will be figuring out. Haven't figured out yet, but the well, best I gotta, way to capture I can, their information. I can give you a tip. So okay. I, I can sh- tell you what I did uh, figured out for myself. Don't know if it's the best version, but it was better than what I was doing before. Um, I'm using an app called Evernote. Okay. And Evernote lets you take, a, um, take your cell phone. You just take the card that somebody gave you and you scan it. Mm. And it automatically it doesn't always work, especially when people make fancy cards. Oh. That's the lesson I learned. Much better to make a plain white card with just plain old black lettering on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll see if I remember this lesson for myself here in a minute. Um, <laughs> then the one that's all glossy and yep. picturey and everything, because the 
the phone can scan it easily. And it puts the name in there, it puts the email and phone number in, and then you just press a button and it puts it into a contact list and then it sends them an email right away, a follow-up email with your contact. Uh -huh. See, Everybody. that's Got the it. hard part. Talk about follow-up. Isn't follow-up one of the most stressful things in running a business? Yes. Yes, it really is. Um, what are some clever ways to follow up? What's some first things that come to mind for you? Um, I am a big fan of Google Calendar. I use I use everything Google online. Um, so sometimes I'll just make it an event on my calendar. Like, okay, I talked to this person and they haven't gotten back to me. So I need to follow up with them by Friday or whatever. And I just put it on my own calendar. Like, you know check in with so-and-so. Um, so that's a good way to do it. I need to be a better email organizer, you know, <laughs> label things. Do you use Gmail? As follow-up, I do. Uh, yeah. There is a plug-in, I know I was like, Lidge is pitching all these things moment, but no, there's a plug-in <laughs> called Boomerang, which is kind of cool. Uh -huh. um, and it, it integrates with Gmail so that you have an email and then um, for this, so I would use it for this interview. So okay. uh, an email comes from you saying that you signed up and then I send you a message and then I click the boomerang button. I say, make sure that spins back to me in two weeks so that I oh, see it. And I cool. think Gmail has something called snooze built in now on your phone. So you can have something bounce back to you in a week. Ah, I have noticed that Gmail has automatically started. So if I have had a thread going with somebody and it's been a certain number of days, it'll pop it back up to the top of my inbox and say, you know, hey, it's been five days. Do you want to respond to this? That's right. So, I think maybe I'm seeing some of that too. That's pretty cool. Yeah. See, this is why we're doing this, y'all. This <laughs> is we, it's not geeky stuff. We love this stuff. Yeah. This is so important. This is the stuff that stresses you out when you're trying to run the business aspect mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. It's nothing more stressful than um, well, it's not stressful, but you I just feel like a real loser when I start a great conversation with somebody and then it just falls off the radar. Yeah. And then later on I'm like, man, why didn't I follow through on that? You know, that could have been a great mm -hmm. record or it could yeah. have been a great guest for the podcast. Um, all right. Well, so social media, what, uh, what do we need to know about social media? Do you, um, do you guys use it in a way that is very manual, like stop what you're doing, take a picture of something, post it, say something incredibly clever and engaging, or do you, you, do you find that some, um, tools around social media that help automate things are helpful? Um, we tend to be pretty spontaneous with it. Um, we try to be diligent about posting very regularly. Um, but we just like it to be fun. And I feel like if you schedule it, it gets a little forced. Like maybe your idea just isn't really there and it just looks blah and people don't engage with it. Um, you know, for instance, on Mara Machines, I was um, in the shop. We have big maps on the wall and we put push pins in um, where we have machines at. Um, and so Friday I'm like hovering on this ladder, <laughs> putting push pins in the map. And I was like, Hey, Dante, take a picture of me. And I put it on Facebook, you know, like, you know, Hey, it's dangerous to be a business owner or something like right. that. <laughs> and people really liked it. It's just like, you know, like silly stuff. Analog like tape is dangerous. That's right. It's more rock and roll. It's what I do for my business. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's cool. So, so I think another thing is when people hear that and they go, scheduling regularly is important, then I start getting stressed out. I'm like, well, what's regular? What's the mm -hmm. right amount of time? What, what, what does that mean to you? What, what feels like um, consistent social media? Um, for the studio, we do try to do it daily. Um, Mar Machines is maybe a little bit less frequent. Um, but yeah, at least several times a week just to stay on people's radar and both. I feel like Instagram is the the thing right now. It really is. Um, but we have huge followings on Facebook. So it's yeah. important to stay active on there and, and keep people engaged. But I feel like our engagement, especially for 79, which I'm not sure why, but the engagement is much higher on Instagram right now. Um, let's talk about, uh, we really got to geek out on this stuff because I know this is, these are the questions that I ask. Um, so hopefully other people are asking them too. Uh, your your studio will have a Facebook page that mm -hmm. is like the face of the studio, and maybe that page is posting once a day. Yes. And as it is there, um, do different, but but your studio is comprised of like multiple people. So right. does e can any one of those people sort of post from the page and be the voice of the studio for that day on social media? Yep. Yep. So our um, we have a booking coordinator, and she has access to it, so she can do photos. Chris can, I can. 
Uh, Cameron can if he's doing something cool downstairs. So it's very much a team effort. Cameron's always doing something cool downstairs. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I think it is important to make it a team effort if you have team members because it keeps your voice a little bit fresher. Or maybe if the same person is doing it every day, they're just like bored and somebody else is like, oh, this is cool. You know? Yeah. All right. Well, um, let's take a break now. Rockstars will come back in just a moment for the jam session. And a reminder that we'll include links in the show notes. So if you're on your mobile device, just click through and you'll see stuff there, including I'll put it together a YouTube playlist. Um, I haven't done that yet, but uh, I'm sure we got some really cool videos online of Welcome to 1979 Mm -hmm. stuff to put in there and um, a link to their website. So you can go check it out. We'll see you in just a minute for the jam session. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Yoli Mara from Welcome to 1979. Yoli, you ready to jam? I am. All right, cool. Let's dig into some more questions about uh, running the studio and and managing all this stuff. Um, One of the challenges, I think, for having a a facility, now I know this can be a technical one, but I feel like it's, I feel like above and beyond technical, it's more of an organizational one, is maintenance and just keeping a place running. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about um, the smart ways to keep a big operation like Welcome to 1979 and the other businesses just running and always stocked and organized? Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I did. Oh, no. Um, stocked and organized. Yeah. Um, what everybody, every intern who ever starts with us knows very quickly is my least favorite thing to ever be told is that we are out of something. <laughs> As in stop what you're doing right now and go to Costco, you know. Um, so... Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I have a very important rule for my interns where... There's a video that says that they have to have three rolls of toilet paper on top of, like a pyramid on top of the toilet in the bathroom, the studio bathroom, yes. because you don't ever want to run out of that. No, absolutely. Um, so again, it's really having the right interns and assistants in-house and understanding that they will face my wrath if, <laughs> if we are out of something, I have to stop what I'm doing, or if I get back from Costco and they're like, oh, by the way, there's no light bulbs or <laughs> or whatever. So, um, and then... I've really, you know, 
struggling in your 20s, you know, right? You go buy one thing of toilet paper or whatever. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm feeling like a real full-fledged adult now. So I just buy like too much of everything. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really my thing is if somebody says they need, you know, one of this, I go buy three and then I don't have to think about it for a while. Yeah. So we tried doing clever things where we had a shared list app where I'm like, if I'm at the store yep. and the intern notices something's missing, you just put it on there. But the problem with that is Sometimes the clever stuff is a little too clever to really work well. Mm -hmm. Some of it really works and some of it is just like, yeah, it never worked, yeah. you know, and just like calling somebody is the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Track sheets, that was a problem for a while. Like, you know, an assistant would go grab the last one oh, <laughs> out yeah. of the box. Uh, so and so they just put a note in when there's only like, you know, 30 or 40 left and it's like, order more track sheets. What's a track sheet? What's a track sheet? We live in this, we live in a computery age. That's true. I guess when you record to tape, right, you have a, a sheet with your whatever, 24 tracks listed on there, and they write right on the sheet what instrument or whatever yeah. is coming through each of the tracks. There's so. the pencil and paper. That's it's right. It's still a very, very important <laughs> part of the process. Um, so so basically, you just have to train each uh, each assistant or intern to know that these are some of the things that run out, and mm -hmm. when they get low. Yep take responsibility for it. I feel like mm -hmm. that's part of the message too, is like when it you is. see something and it looks a little out of whack, you don't just pass by it as if like, oh, well, that's kind of junky. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's like you yeah. own it and you're like, let's let's fix this thing. You yeah, know? you don't put the last Coke in the fridge and then just, you know, go about your day. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, what about the maintenance side of stuff that things are broken? Is there, um, is there any, any more systematized process to making sure that things are getting fixed and worked on and replaced back in the studio? I think uh, Chris has a form that, you know, the assistants or engineer or whoever is working fills out if something is not working right during a session. Um, you know, we have the perk of having the Mara Machines shop there. So I think there's a lot that we're able to handle in-house having a full-time tech right there and take a look at things. Um, so... Well, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, I don't have that here. <laughs> um, I just got to come over there. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, what about um, studio manager? Let's talk about that that role. Um, what does a studio manager do, and who might it appeal to as a job opportunity? I feel like what I've learned, um, you know, so Chris and I did everything ourselves for a long time, and maybe for the last five or six years have had somebody. Um, who has taken on a variety of titles, um, but probably most accurate is studio manager. They've been called booking coordinator and that kind of stuff in the past. Um, and um, that person handles a lot of keeping the calendar full, outreach to people. Um, when Chris was doing all of that himself, what would happen is being an engineer, he'd get booked on a 10-day session, right? He's not following up with people <laughs> and reaching out. So he'd be busy, 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 busy. And then it would drop because he wasn't doing the work <laughs> to keep right, exactly. to keep the message going out there. Um, so that person for us kind of fills that role of, you know, client relations um, and, you know, bringing the work in, doing the outreach, whatever it is, going to shows, going to industry events, meeting people. Do you, do you remember the transition a little bit for that? Do you remember the, um, the sense of like these client relations are mine and they're personal and I'm now sort of trying to hand them off to somebody? Yes. Well, what's that like? How, how do you um, do that? It got a little bit, you had to be really careful about it. Um, some people would really be offended if they were used to dealing with one of us and we just handed them over to somebody else. And they felt like maybe that person wasn't giving them the answers that they thought that one of us would give them. You know, they felt like, like shoved into some different category of, you know, <laughs> yeah, unimportance. Right, right. Um so it's really a matter of knowing your clients and knowing which ones you have to sort of finesse. And there's definitely a few that maybe um, we don't want to hand off to somebody else, you know, <laughs> that may be okay. Maybe it's better if we just keep dealing with this person and, and do that. So it is. Is there, um, does the phone still exist, you know, or some version yes. of the digital phone in the studio where, uh, you know, whoever's at the front desk is the first person that somebody new talks to? How does that work in your world? Is it? Um, do people still email, talk about that. Like, are there multiple email accounts that make it work in a business? Stuff, mm -hmm. stuff like um, that. 
We actually use an app called Ring Central. It's like a yearly subscription thing. Um, so we actually have an 800 number for the studio. And you call that and you get a menu. <laughs> um, wow. And it's like, you know, press one for booking, press two for billing. Like there's a whole menu. You can get to Mar machines and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then we each have the app on our cell phone. So there's no actual phone at the studio. Um, but A, you don't have to give your cell phone number out <laughs> to every single person that you have contact with. That's great. Um, B, you can manage things when you're on the run. I can be, you know, <laughs> at the grocery store and see that there's a call and take it or not take it. It gives you a nice little, like if you answer the phone, um, it gives you as the person answering like a little warning. It's like you have a call for billing, press one to accept, two to decline. Right. So if it's a time where I can't really talk to them, I can push two and send it to my voicemail or I can just talk to them in my car or wherever I am. Yeah. Um, so it's been Unless really- Unless Rockstars, you're the one listening right now who is making that call, then that's not happening to you. <laughs> Dolly's definitely talking No, about no, oh. I would never send you to voicemail. <laughs> um, and it's really great and we can transfer to each other. So if somebody chooses the wrong- extension i can transfer to chris no matter like physically where we are so and what was it really called ring central ring central all right cool mm -hmm. love it that's a yeah. great tip yeah um i don't know you know that may be I mean, that you know honestly that sounds advanced but that could be useful even if you only have two people that need to manage mm -hmm. a studio yeah you know? it really is and like i said it gives you that sort of you know things can get very personal and entwined and Maybe I don't want everybody to have my cell phone number and text me on the weekend. <laughs> right, because you know? that happens. That so you can decide happens. if you take it or not take it. You can set business hours um, so that after a certain time in the evening, all those Ring Central calls go to your voicemail. Mm -hmm. But then you get a little notification that you have a voicemail. So again, yeah. you can constantly be monitoring it. But it's a nice way to kind of, when you run your own business, to give it some boundaries. I'm going to suggest that you could even, Rockstar, start with something like that before you have a manager, mm -hmm. you can start with that. And then now when you finally find somebody you want to try managing your studio, you just simply uh, you know, include them in this process. Yeah, you just give them an extension and That's there they very are. Cool. It's really easy. Um, okay, uh, let's see. What was the next one I wanted to ask you? I'm so fascinated by what you're saying. I'm forgetting to look down at my <laughs> questions here. Um, uh I guess let's let's talk about some of the events that you guys are doing there too. So, okay. um, you know, you have the recording summit, which is mm -hmm. just such a cool thing. Um, tell us, give us, give us the full pitch on what's the recording summit and and why are, should the rock stars be already clamoring to buy their ticket for the next one? All right. Well, the recording summit is an event we do every November. Um, we just had our tenth one this past November. Um, so it's kind of. The concept behind it when we started out was um, like a more personal scaled back, say, AES type of situation. Um, so, you know, at AES, they do the panels and there's lots of, you know, parties and things in the evenings, but it's also very huge and there's a trade show floor and that whole thing. Um, so we wanted to do something that was more just, it only takes place at our studio um, and it's just workshops for the whole weekend plus fun events. Um, we limit attendance to 60 people. So it's, you know, it's never going to be overcrowded or just get big and impersonal and out of hand. Um, and then we, we, we bring in people from all over the country. We usually have about 30 panelists who come in. So, you know, <laughs> the ratio of panelists to attendees is very good. Um, and they come in and speak on any number of topics. We try to balance it between real techie stuff. Like, you know, we have a bunch of, uh, high-end mix engineers come in and people can bring a mix for them and they will listen to it and offer some critique and advice yeah, on it. Yeah, that's great. Um, but we also try to cover business stuff. We almost always have something that gets into the social media piece um, or like how to get started and run things like basics of are you using QuickBooks or should you incorporate and, you know. I learned about QuickBooks at the summit right. from Larry Crane. Larry Crane, yeah. Tape op rock stars. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Larry was talking about using QuickBooks online and uh -huh. I was like, I kept thinking about it. I was like, I got to get signed up with that. Yeah. Now I am. It's amazing. Go. Um, anyway, so in addition to the all day long, so all day Saturday, all day Sunday are these panels. There's always, um, one going on upstairs in the control room and one downstairs. So you always have choices. Um, so choices, it's not like but you're... not too many choices. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and it all starts Friday night. So we do a big kickoff party on Friday nights. 
Um, and it's really fun. Almost everybody shows up for it. <laughs> so people yeah. like to get into town and do it. And um, what we've done the past several years is we do a direct to disc recording at that party. Um, I know you got a really good story about one of the recent ones. Yeah. So the surprise guest. <laughs> yes. Um, so we just have always tried to do like somebody fun or somebody local. And um, we just decided to try to get maybe a little bit of a bigger fish. And um, we've always had a pretty good relationship with 30 Tigers. So we just were like, hey, do you have any artists who you think would like to do this thing? And it's a little bit hard to pitch because people don't necessarily understand it, that it's, you know, it's a live recording. It's one take yeah, going well, straight onto the lacquer. <laughs> yeah, let's let's over explain what the live to disc thing is. Sure. Um, so in live to disc, we have our um, our vinyl lathe. And um, so the way it works is when they're recording, the needle is dropped. It looks like a record is playing, right. but it's actually recording. And you can't stop. It has to go all the way through that side. So whether it's four or five, six songs, whatever you're doing on the side, once that band starts, <laughs> they have to get through that entire side without mucking anything up. That's awesome. <laughs> without a break. Um, and then they get a little break. And then we do the B-side. Um, so And the, really... the band is set up in the studio. Everything's mic'd up. It's being mixed. Mm -hmm. um, is Chris usually mixing it? Yep. Chris yeah. usually is. Sometimes he brings somebody in, you know, to... Yeah, and they're just mixing it live on mm -hmm. the console upstairs. Yep. Yep. But it's, it's kind of clever now I think about it. The band's downstairs, mic'd up. All that's coming up upstairs to the console, getting mixed. And that's going back downstairs to the mastering yep. room where Cameron <laughs> is. And it's hitting the lay, then it gets cut that way. So yep. really cool thing. So you guys did a recent one, and the guest was a bit of a surprise to everybody. It was. So um, we actually had Jason Isbell come in and do it. And... Um, it was one of those things that was like too easy. Like there weren't a lot of layers to get to him and he was really into doing it. But I think we were so nervous about like something going wrong at the last minute or they go, oh, never mind. He doesn't want to do it. That we decided not to tell anybody, like <laughs> even great. some of our closest friends who come in for it. They're like, who is it? We're like, oh, well, can't tell you. So, um, so on that Friday during the day, we keep the studio, we keep everybody away anyways, because <laughs> we're just trying to get stuff done. So they just came in and, you know, did a sound check in the afternoon. And then we kept them way in the back in the electroplating shop until mm -hmm. everybody had gotten there and it was time to drop the needle and they just walked in and it was super cool. Um, and then kind of the icing on the cake was uh, that um, Jason and his management, oh, let me back up for a minute. So what we do after that, now that we have the electroplating shop is one of our electroplating guys actually stays overnight at the studio on Friday and plates it right away. And then one of the other electroplating guys comes in at like four in the morning, picks up the stampers, drives them up to Palomino Record Pressing in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they press 100 copies during the day, and we usually have them back at like three or four on Saturday afternoon. That's so cool. Um, and everybody who comes to the summit gets a copy of it. Um, anyway... And then I feel like that drive, that the role of driving up there and doing it and bringing it back, it's kind of like putting the names in the name tags. It is. If you really want this thing to work, you're yep. willing to do the drive. That's you know? right. Um, anyway, and then kind of our agreement with the artists is that they then own the master. So if they wanted to press more copies of it down the road, they could. Well, it turns out Jason and his team liked it so much that they already had a record store day release planned. And they pulled it and replaced it wow. with this and uh, pressed another 5,000 copies of it. Wow, and it sold out awesome. like immediately on Record Store Day. So that's amazing. It's super cool. Um, I remember years ago seeing a manager, I forgot who it was, uh, came to speak at my, my school and he was talking about um, managing a, a major artist and you know this, this artist then got, a, got to sing for the Super Bowl. Um, and I'm not going to name drop because I'm just going to screw it up if I do. But the message, the takeaway I got was, you know, he talked about um, career paths, which I think would apply to businesses like you're doing too, that they sometimes have these plateaus like you do and then you have a big thing, mm -hmm. something happens and it's like you're on a next plateau. Does that, did that one feel a bit like that for you guys? Like that sort of, uh, I know, you know, selling tape machines to Pete Townsend was really yeah. a thrill too. <laughs> Um, do you ever notice or feel like there are things that happen that just kind of 
take everything to the next plateau for you? Or is, or is that advice maybe really specific for just an artist touring? Um, you know, I think all of that helps and I think it builds up. I don't know if it necessarily plateaus, but yeah, you just like, it's a feather in the cap. And there definitely are certain people who will ask or are looking for those names, you know, and experiences that you have. So, yeah. Well, I do know that you guys have always had um, a really proactive outreach mm -hmm. for, for what you do. Uh, I think of Chris um, or, or of you uh, um, sponsoring at the AES golf tournament, for mm -hmm. example, just just things like that, always making a gesture, always like going out of your way to be present in mm -hmm. places. Maybe talk a little bit about that and what does that mean? And do you see people sometimes, uh, you know, missing opportunities because they're not doing that sort of thing? Um, absolutely. You know, we've always been very community focused from just doing the parties and stuff that we've always done early on. Um, the Recording Summit is very much a community building, <laughs> bringing people together. Because if you look at it from the outside, we're all competitors, right? You could look at it that way. Like I'm inviting these other recording engineers to come in. Well, Chris is a recording engineer, right? But it, it never feels like that. Or other people who own studios come in and talk. And it just, it's so collaborative and, you know, sharing ideas that it it's never, you know, that never feels like a thing. Um, but yeah, we have always, uh, Chris especially, just made an effort to be out in the community. Like you said, AES does a charity golf tournament every year and we've sponsored a whole for, yeah five or six years now. Um, and it's just good for people to know that you're out there and you care about what's going on. And, you know, I feel like if we didn't do on the flip side, if this year we were like, oh, we're not going to do a whole, it would feel like a red flag to other people of like, maybe things aren't going well oh, over there. Like right. That. Or <laughs> there's <laughs> always a twist. Yeah. I wonder why they're not doing that. But, um, also just AES and NAM, like, Chris has always been really good about finding opportunities to go and speak to different audiences and get his name out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so. Do you guys consider yourselves to be very um, socially capable people? I don't know if that's the right way to ask it. In <laughs> other words, do you feel like you are like, like it's a breeze to be social and, and interacting? Or is it one of those things where you sort of have to push against your, your desire to stay home and watch Netflix this particular <laughs> night, you know? Um, I think we're very different people in that realm. Chris, to me, is an incredibly social person, and he always has been, and he has a huge web of friends, and I'm very much the opposite. I have my close friends <laughs> and people, and I am the one who wants to stay home and watch Netflix and not try to interface with new people. Um, and so that is something I really have had to push through as, you know— I could be that way back in the beginning when I was just, you know, doing invoices from the house and whatever. But as right. I got more and more involved in a role of like, okay, this really is the path I'm going to take as, you know, co-owner of the studio and all these other businesses. And um, really doing the summit has really helped with that as well. It's yeah. like, I feel like, especially it was intimidating at first in that I don't know anything about recording. <laughs> I still don't know a ton about recording. I think you even said that when I was asking you to be on the podcast. <laughs> I was like, we don't have to talk about recording. We want um, to know about all the other stuff. But I just, I felt like for a long time, like I wouldn't find anybody to talk to who, <laughs> you know, would, I would have anything in common with. And um, I learned I was completely wrong. So. Well, I, th <laughs> I think maybe another good lesson too is that something as, um, you know, as cool as the recording summit you know, it starts out with just an idea mm -hmm. and then you take a chance on it the first time and probably feel nervous as hell. Yeah. And then it, you know, you, it just, the first one's kind of small and you try a couple of things and then you add some more and add some mm -hmm. more and add some more. And after 10 years, you know, for somebody on the outside, it's like, man, how do you do that? I don't, I can't do that. I don't, mm -hmm. you guys got connections with manufacturers, sponsors, right. you know, 60 people selling out tickets, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to one and the listening party, I guess on Saturday night was wildflowers, mm -hmm. the, the Tom Petty record. And here's Richard Dodd sitting there talking about making the entire record and how he mixed it and everything. Mm -hmm. Just incredible. So I think it's a good reminder. Um, you know, you got to start small and then it yeah. grows from there, you know, mm -hmm. Absolutely. at least I think, unless your answer is like, not on a lidge, we knocked it out of the park in the very first one. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> Uh, no, it was definitely, you know, a growing process. Um, I think we lucked into a few really stellar panelists and we did um, 
was it the first year or the second year, you know, that Alan Parsons Skyped in on Saturday oh, that's night? that's right. Yeah. yeah. And it just happened to be actually one of the guys who was attending the summit is who connected us with him. He's like, hey, you know, I forget what he was doing for Alan at the time, but he's like, I think I can connect you and make this happen. And we were like, awesome. So That's great. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I feel like that's a good segue into some of our usual jam session questions. Um, first of which is uh, when you started out, what do you think was holding you back? So what does started out mean? I, let's just pick something. The studio, the recording summit, the, you know, the the four businesses. Yeah. Um, I really think it's what I said. I think what was holding me back was feeling like I didn't belong. Like I wasn't part of this community. I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have the background to really be there even, you know, and then, um, it was just a matter of pushing past that and, you know, other people making me look at what I was doing and saying, you know, maybe you do. <laughs> and here you are, I a think, recording yeah, studio rock exactly. star. Exactly. So it really was taking a lot of risks and in some cases being just forced, <laughs> just pushed <laughs> out um, there. Do you have a personal way of of sort of leaning into the thing of of making a move when you're nervous and afraid to do it? Anything you've discovered about yourself and how you push through that? Um, you know, Chris is really helpful in that. I think he really understands me and sees my hesitation. Like with this today, I was like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm so sorry I if I stressed you out. I don't know. And he was like, you know, stop it. You're going to do great. You know, I wouldn't have suggested you do this <laughs> if I thought it was going to be terrible. Um, and so it's really just putting stuff on the calendar and just making yourself do it sometimes. That's good advice. And just going and doing it. I cranked up like the silliest, silliest song on the way here. I turned the radio on and my kids had it on like some pop station. And it was like Paula Abdul straight up. And I was like, hey, I can do this. Turn on some 90s jams and here we are. So <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, the calendar idea, again, uh, uh, I guess an analogy for me is sometimes I could feel like, man, I, you know, I, I'd love to take a vacation to Florida one weekend or mm -hmm. something like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't afford that or I can't fit that into my schedule yeah. or whatever until you go, you know what, I'm just going to simply put it on my calendar yep. and buy a ticket ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes, it's like, it happens, you know? Yep. And I guess that there's a lot of power in the calendar. Uh, the flip side of that is if you put it on and you're the only one who knows you put it in the calendar, sometimes <laughs> that doesn't work as That's well. That's true. Right? That's true. Absolutely. There is you know, like I said, accountability to Chris or, you know, this I had scheduled with you. It's like, all right, Lynn but, is expecting me. But at no. the same time, you guys were <laughs> clever not to uh, be too accountable for the Chris Isbell live to live to dish. <laughs> exactly. You know, you got to be careful. Yeah. Accountable internally. That's right. Um, all right. So uh, what about some of the best advice you remember receiving, um, you know, about what you do in business? Do you remember receiving any great advice from anybody? Anybody you really admired? Hmm. I do know That's you've had toughie. some. I've had a guest on the show, um, Eva, Ivana Manley. Yes. Who was here as a result of meeting her through the the recording oh, summit through you guys. That's cool. Um, I imagine she's probably had some pretty inspiring advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, operating a giant business. Yeah, Ivana is great. Um, you know, one thing that our accountant told us. This is pretty dry and boring, but never not here. Once your rate, always your rate. So, okay, good. That's great advice. You know, what does that mean? That means that if somebody is trying to beat you up, I feel like our studio rates are very reasonable and they try to give you a deal. You try to get you to give you a deal, right? And you give them a deal. And then guess what? They're going to tell their friend what price they paid and that friend's going to tell another friend. And it's a very small community here. So once you come off of it, it's very hard to come back up. Yeah. So... I feel like a um, a way of dealing with that, because at the same time, you're balancing that against what you said before, which is, you know, the the client, your your customer is always right, right. you know, and mm -hmm. how do you how do you manage that? Um, I guess if they haven't booked you yet, they're not your customer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but one thing I find is sometimes, you know, if you can keep your rate where it is, but then as a business, you make the generous offer to give some extra. Yep or give some free or something mm -hmm. like that, then your rate stayed where it was. Your, you know, your value is clear. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you just look like a super good guy because you just gave something. You yep. Know? Yep. That's very good. We do that a lot with tape machines. Like, you know, we'll 
throw in some accessories with it, you know, right. edity blocks or whatever. Right. And yeah, like you said, doesn't erode your basic price. Um, again, any advice um, in terms of that, you know, with Recording Summit, you're talking to a lot of other studio owners in different regions and, you know, different sizes. Do you see people sometimes missing out on an opportunity to have a band in for two weeks because they didn't think to only charge them for a week and a half or something. Rental companies, for example, would would have that approach mm -hmm. where it's like a four day week. Mm -hmm. You know, when you rent you rent a microphone from somewhere, yeah, and you pay for four days, but you get to keep it for the week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, without getting into too many specifics, yeah. do you have any more tips around that? Those concepts. Again, we try to do like you said, like with throwing something in. So maybe we throw if it's a longer session. We throw in a day off in the middle with no, you know, we'll leave all your stuff set up right, and right. nobody will touch it. And you can take the day and you're not charged for that day and, you know, that kind yeah, of stuff. Clever. So, yeah, those kinds of things. Um, we always transfer. So if they if they record a tape, you know, the transfer out to digital is always included and that kind of stuff. So. Um, OK, good. I'm glad you brought that up uh, again without digging into too much technical stuff. What's your concept and understanding of things like backups, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if you make tape backups, if that's part of the analog world or if the, um, you know, I know in the digital world, people record on hard drives mm -hmm. as a studio. I think we're often faced with archiving, you know, at least asking ourselves the question, should we archive everything that's coming through here? Do we have some responsibility to keep it safe for a client when, you know, they lose something months down the road? Just any, any thoughts about that, that you've learned? Um, you know, Chris deals with a lot more of that than I do. I think everything analog is basically backed up digitally. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot no, with the technicals, no. though. That's okay. Um, but we do. We definitely don't keep everything indefinitely. We have run into some things where somebody came back years later and we're like, right. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we try to be very clear in our communication of how long it will stay on our hard drive, you know, so, yeah. you know, let's talk you about something that else from us. What's a, what are some smart methods of being very clear and is it better to be clear at the beginning or after you just did all the work? <laughs> Both. Um, but we try to be very clear at the beginning. So when somebody, um, we require a studio deposit, you know, to put days on the calendar. Um, so once they pay that deposit, they get a document from us that just goes over, all the ins and outs from cancellation policy to, you know, we try to balance it with, you know, cool, interesting stuff, you know, <laughs> like we have a slide or feel free to do this or please post on social media with more like if you cancel with fewer than this number of days notice, here's the thing. So it's got the nitty gritty in it and it, it would go into, you know, how long we back things up. And yeah, I love that you just, said, that. just pointed out that you're also helping a client know how to uh, post on social media and promote you guys yeah. when they're there. That's Absolutely. smart. Yeah. Make it easy for them to help you mm -hmm. by letting them know uh, what would really help. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, cool. So uh, this one's funny. So usually I ask what for a recording tip hack or secret sauce, but maybe there's... <laughs> <laughs> Something you had in mind for, um, you know, managing management hack tip or secret sauce? Um, good question. Again, I would go back to Google, Google, Google. Yeah. Um, we use um, all of the studio stuff is on a Google calendar. And then I have various other Google calendars. So I can see everything in one place. I can see who in electroplating has a day off. I can see what studio is in, what band is in the studio, you know, do you can, guys upgrade to the Google Suite, I think it's called? We don't. The, the business version. We're not super fancy like See, that. See, but that's great. I, yeah. I love that because it's just a reminder that yeah. so much can be done with just what's sitting yeah. there waiting for you. Yep. And then Google Docs. Um, yeah. Lots of shared spreadsheets out there. Um, again, kind of part of, to me, kind of one of the perks of owning your own business. Um, not a lot of my job really requires me to be in the building, you know. So we can go visit our family in Wisconsin, but I can log onto my computer every day and see what shipped in electroplating and go to my QuickBooks online and invoice those customers and do all that stuff, you know, without calling my electroplating manager or whatever. Like everything is just in there and we all see what the other people are doing and it's yeah. priceless. <laughs> um, okay, let's let's dig into another question about that. What are the th some of the things that you've learned you really don't want to do when you're mixing, like, you know, 
the the traveling family lifestyle mm-hmm. with the work on the computer? What are some of the things we're like, you know what I've learned that this kind of sucks when I do this? Um, probably just never, ever just turning it off yeah. <laughs> and stepping away from it. Like just that's part of the problem of, you know, our phone in our hand all the time is it's like, oh, let me just check my email. And then maybe you see one that you didn't necessarily want to see. And then it's on your mind or you decide you have to deal with it when really, you know, you should be on vacation. (laughs) Um, So I feel like that can be a little bit of a downside is sometimes you just have to force yourself to actually do maybe an out of office auto reply (laughs) and, and step away for a few days and actually have some time. Um, okay. Well, let's talk about some of the, uh, some of the tools. So you, you mentioned Google, mm-hmm. QuickBooks online. What are some other digital tools that, that come to mind as far as, um, you find you very useful? Um, oh, uh, MailChimp was another. Yeah, MailChimp. We use that. Um, and then social media, you said it was Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. And I was think Twitter our... a thing, you know, I'm not on Twitter personally, but I think there's a link. Like I think whatever we put on Facebook Somehow there's some sort of software that automatically posts it to Twitter as right, well. Right. Um, but yeah, I would say Facebook and Instagram are the primary socials that we're on. Um, shoot, I had I do have else. a question for you about Facebook mm-hmm. that I forgot to ask earlier. Um, so we mentioned that there's a studio page that that's mm-hmm. useful and that people can be admins of the page so they can take turns posting. Um, but then I imagine everybody sort of has their personal Facebook too. Yes. And I think sometimes people struggle with like, well, does my personal do I put on just the picture of the kids or right. is the personal one? Can I put the thing about the business too? Do you have any mm-hmm. thoughts about that or anything you learned or does it not even matter? Um, I think it's a really personal choice. So I keep my Facebook page pretty personal. I obviously have a lot of industry friends, <laughs> you know, that are Facebook friends of mine. Um, but if I've just met somebody really randomly or I kind of quasi know who they are and they send me a friend request, I'm not likely to accept it. Like I just, I like to keep that smaller. It's gotten much bigger than it used to be. Yeah. Um, but still, I just, if somebody like likes a picture of my kids or <laughs> comments or something, I want it to be somebody Sorry that, that I would have a conversation <laughs> with if I ran into them in the grocery yeah. store kind of a thing. Um, Chris goes the opposite with his and his is very much, um, a business page. And maybe that's because he's both studio owner and engineer. Me too. Um, I I ended up going that way too. Yeah. His is very, so he shares a lot of the studio and Mara Machines posts or promotes, you know, events that he's speaking at and that kind of stuff. And I mean, I'll put stuff like that on my page, but not, you know, not in the same way. And my audience is, you know, I have like 400 friends or something. So I always feel like the sign of, um, you know, it feel of, of it feeling good is, is when something gets posted and then there's some interaction. Mm-hmm. So I, I just, I tend to like go with whichever, you know, it's like if I put it on my personal page yeah. and it gets a conversation going, well, mm-hmm. then that's the one that makes me feel like I did the right yep, thing. I agree. Um, or uh-huh. if it's on the the business page. So I don't know. I do feel like everybody's, I don't know if anybody uh, overall is, if, if there's ever going to be a time where everybody feels like they understand what's going on in social media, no. I feel like it's just a nonstop question mark Yep, yep. <laughs> and we're all just like always figuring it out. Uh-huh. And then when you join in and figure it out, it's like, it changes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's as soon as you thing. think you've got it figured out and yeah. your posts are getting interaction, then it just drops off again. Yeah. Um, although I would say that it does seem like Instagram is great for the, you know, people just love to just see images and Yes. Studios are pretty cool to to drop pictures of what's going on and mm-hmm. you know pretty cool pretty cool and pretty easy to just have a photo of somebody who's playing on a mic. Yeah. Oh, what what about tips there? Um how often or or not how often, but have you ever learned that sometimes you need to make sure you ask permission, you know, sometimes sometimes people aren't comfortable? We always 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 ask permission for social media. Um especially if it's somebody, you know, who's more of a named artist right. or whatever. All the more reason for you to want to share it on social media too, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got a pretty good spanking a long time ago for posting oh, that's <laughs> something. Great. You don't have to get we, into the details, no. but thank you for letting us but, know. That, uh, that we that really exists. did. It was it was a long time ago, probably five years ago or something, but we learned a very valuable lesson <laughs> about always, always, that's always great. asking permission. Because sometimes an artist, maybe they're working on something and they don't want their fans to know they're working on it yet. Like they right. may have a whole launch planned or sometimes a bigger artist doesn't want people to know physically where they are. 
So True. there's a lot to consider there. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, I guess just asking, uh, asking before you post it and mm-hmm. maybe having that internal barometer that says the more I'm excited I am about making this photo and posting it, the more likely I better ask permission yep. before I do it. That's really a good point. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, uh, what about hardware tools? I mean, again, usually this is like somebody's like, oh, 1176, I love it as a yeah. compressor. But <laughs> I mean, I imagine there's anything physical that you're just really glad you've got around when you're running the studio. Um, uh, obviously a laptop. That's my laptop. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely my laptop. Um, also, this is both hardware and software that I forgot to mention, but we use Square for credit card processing and okay, cool. it is the godsend. Um, I don't know how we... <laughs> I mean, remember when people just used to write checks or mail us checks all the time? That's so weird. Um, so, yeah. So I have the little card reader and an iPad, and it just is a super easy way to take payment. Now, Square is useful for the in-person credit card swipe, right? Oh, it's useful for online, too. You can actually send an invoice through Square that sends them an email. They click the link, and they can pay that invoice with their credit card wherever they are. And does that connect in then to your QuickBooks online? So so QuickBooks is more of the place to organize everything? Exactly. That's the problem that I'm currently battling is because QuickBooks is also in the credit card processing space. So they don't talk well right. to Square. They're like, we want you to use ours. Yeah. So I started using like an app to bring my Square stuff in because what you wind up doing is doing the transaction in Square and then going back, basically doing it twice because then you have to put it all in QuickBooks. But I'm about to delete the app because it just, it doesn't bring any customer information over. It brings you like, it makes an invoice to Square basically (laughs) with all your transactions from that day and the total amount deposited. And it okay. doesn't it doesn't let you like apply them to QuickBooks invoices or figure out what they are. Right. So right. it doesn't it's not helpful. Well, I guess that's <laughs> that's a challenge that we'll always be faced with. You yeah. know, you're always just trying to tweak that. Yeah. Um, so you spend a little less time doing things twice. Yeah. But um, yeah. when you talk about bringing in customers, it just reminded me to ask you if you wanted to share any more thoughts about um, what it means as a studio to find new customers yeah. and bring in new new clients. Um, for example. Uh, I would I would ask the question about advertising. Have you ever found advertising to be useful? Um, I think part of the answer is, what do you think sponsoring a whole at the AAS thing is, you know, or having events like that. But but any more thoughts about that, about, you know, reaching out and bringing mm-hmm. in new customers? Um, that is a lot of the answer. Uh, we have tried a few traditional, like an ad and tape op and that kind of thing years ago, and none of it really felt fruitful. So really we put our marketing and advertising dollars into, right? MailChimp is one thing. But yeah, just being out there, going to AES, doing the golf tournaments, you know, being at NAM. that's all, you know, bringing people to the recording summit. That is all advertising. Okay, so it does bring to mind the question of, again, who are we trying to connect with? Um, Mm -hmm. The things you just listed make me think for sure about engineers and producers. Yes. Um, And obviously, it's a studio that's available to engineers and producers. You want them to... Mm -hmm like it, and then probably bring in the artists that they're working with. Yeah. Have you found that there's sort of different outreaches if you just want to reach the bands and the artists directly? Um, that's where I think more of the parties and things come in, right? Because they want to come out and, <laughs> and have a good time. Um, and then that's where our studio manager comes in, and she is out there actively finding them, bringing them in, reaching out. At an actual event. Just yes. Glad, just just pressing just, yeah, the flesh. Exactly. Or, that doesn't sound right if it's a she, but, you know, <laughs> shaking hands, meeting people, yep. you know, getting contact info. Mm-hmm. Um, what about that? Uh, I just met you. We're at a party. It's loud. Things are moving fast. You're just going for a beer and I'm trying to say hi. Mm-hmm. How do you exchange uh, contact information? What are some smart, quick ways to do that? I don't know. I'm terrible at that. So it's just, we're all that just is, still struggling. Yeah, that is really. Um, do you find business cards yeah. are ever useful? I personally don't use them a lot. I think Chris uses them a lot when he's out. But um, like I said, I'm not that super social person. So I've always stayed away from that role of like bringing business in. Right. I'm happy to manage it and (laughs) deal with existing customers and be that person. But the role for me is definitely not like meeting random people at parties Maybe it's the email list. Maybe it's just having a... um, uh, you know, gathering emails at a party. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you recall that there are smart ways to do that? I mean, I've tried things where we would have a party here and we just literally have like a, you know, a, a clipboard email list, sign yeah. up, you know, and 
I'll send you a recording of the music we just did tonight. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, we've tried that. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, we had a big um, 10th anniversary party in May. Mm -hmm. And um, Wait, didn't you have a whole ton of bands doing live to disc? We did. And I was supposed to bring you a copy and I totally uh, forgot. Uh, all tell right. us tell us I about the 10th anniversary because I know that was quite an event. Um, so yeah, so Chris and Cameron like to do some kind of stunty things. <laughs> so this would definitely be one of them. So since it was the 10th anniversary, they decided to record 10 Adam, 10 bands, artists, direct to disc, um, back to back. So they did one, two, three, four, five, side A, one, two, three, four, five, side B. Um, and then we had no idea how many people were going to show up. <laughs> were there a lot? I think there were about 300 people there. Wow. <laughs> So in addition to the logistics of these bands, and they were all over the studio, um, as you can imagine. Right. <laughs> right? Well, we got 30,000 square feet, so. Right. But we only have 7,000 of it in the studio. All so right, think all about right. that. We're only using that space. Um, obviously, only five had to be set up at once, and then they switched. Um, but it was a lot going on. It was like 95 degrees outside. <laughs> oh, yeah. Summertime. Yeah. Yeah. It was totally crazy. Um they had a technical problem about three songs into the A-side and had to start it over again. Oh, man. <laughs> anyway. And was this multiple bands and drum sets set up? Yep. To just go from one to the other right yep. on the same Absolutely. Console? And some wow. of them were just, you know, say acoustic guitar and vocal or piano and vocal. Yeah. So, you know, and they had set it up, of course, song-wise, you know. It's all charted out. Yeah. And so that it fit well on vinyl, you know, the louder stuff on the outside and that kind of thing. But, um. But yeah, but it went super well. We had a ton of people there. Um, but one of the things we did to collect information, because we knew we'd have a lot of people, is we were giving away, um, with the 10th anniversary, we did a lot of rebranding. Um, we redid our logo and I think I saw that. It our looks website. Great now. Love it. Um, so we gave t-shirts out to every single person who came to the party. And in order to get a t-shirt, they had to put their <laughs> name there and address go. down on the little clipboard. And we had um, Blackbird Academy was super generous with sending a bunch of volunteers. So we had a lot of <laughs> a lot of people there. So we had like three Blackbird students at the T-shirt table, making sure that you that's know great. people wrote stuff down and got their shirts and all that. But so in the online cool. world, that's called the opt-in. You know, yeah. like the yep. um, the lead magnet or whatever, where you give something away mm -hmm. um, and then people sign up for for the email list. Yeah. And in the studio world, uh, it's just great to be reminded it's the same thing. You just yep, have some cool true. like a, a T-shirt. I mean, I don't know if you can do that for a beer or if you might have to ask permission of the city first. But anyway, whatever you can yeah. think of for your studio rock stars, just you know, let me give you this. Here's the sticker, the free free guitar picks, and just put your name on the list or whatever at the party. Mm -hmm. Make sure you get it. Um, okay, cool. So uh, we've talked about software. Was there any other business software that we want to remember to mention? We got the invoicing. We got email. the calendar stuff, the mm -hmm. email stuff, the social media. Um, website. You guys, I believe you have one of your your studio manager. I apologize for not remembering her name, but I saw she had a credit at the bottom of your website, I thought, for having done the new website. Am I remembering that right? Yes. Yep. Um, and that that looked great. So what anything you've learned about like, you know, what's important on a website as far as getting the right message over to to your clients? Um you know, that's a little tricky and, again, a little bit out of my realm. I don't deal with that a lot. But it's really making it easy for them to get to the right information, whether right. it's a link to make a deposit or to find the right person's email address <laughs> on your page. Um, and then I guess having a lot of, like, cool pictures and graphics right. and that kind of stuff. Make it fun. Yeah, exactly. Make it fun, make engaging, it fun. making them stay there longer, right? <laughs> and I, I think what you just said is a good reminder too, because sometimes we look at a website and we just look around at other websites and like, oh, well, we have to have this, right. that, and the other thing. And then you get your head starts to spin. Mm -hmm. But maybe after you you operate for a little bit, you're like, you know what? This is really the most important information that needs to happen yeah. each time. So let's just make that the website. You mm -hmm. know? Um, keep it as simple as you as you can. Um, and then also you did some clever stuff for clients where, you know, you go there and you just see all the record covers. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it's also a reminder that like, yeah, you, these are people making vinyl records mm -hmm. here, you know, the record yep. cover is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then organizational online resource, you know, uh, Google, any other organizational tools that you find really helpful? And also any physical, org- like, do, do we need to have a dry erase board? Do we want, do we need to have a bulletin board? Any, any clever <laughs> stuff like that? Um, we've used various things, especially in electroplating. It's a lot more, a lot more to manage, you know, you're shipping sometimes 30, 40 stampers a day. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot to keep up with. Um, so we do a dry erase board in there of like, every, here's everything that has to ship today. And, you know, here's all the lacquers that came in and need to be processed. Um, so that's done in addition to the spreadsheet, right? So the information is pulled out of the spreadsheet just so the guys who are in there, you know, with gloves on or chemicals in their hands aren't having to dig around the computer. They can just look on the wall and be like, okay, here's what I should process next yeah. and that kind of thing. Um, so um, those are useful there. Do you find, uh, and as probably... This is probably a dumb question because everybody's got it. But do you find Dropbox, for example, to be super useful for managing the business? I hate Dropbox. You hate Dropbox. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked. I don't know. I just, I don't find it very user-friendly. We use Hightail, um, and that's how we have all of our vinyl clients send us files for cutting, mastering clients, that kind of okay, stuff. Okay, cool. That's how we send files out to people, transfers, that kind of stuff. Now, one of the things that Hightail has built into it is it expires after seven days or 14 days mm-hmm. or whatever. Is that part of what makes it useful or um, or not? It can be a little bit of a headache. Actually, right now I have, I just, just this morning reached out to somebody who had sent us files for vinyl cutting and then drug their feet on all the other parts to be really ready to cut the vinyl. So then Cameron went to cut it this morning and the files were expired. <laughs> So, right. yeah, and then it turns into... And I know, run into that sometimes, too. Reaching. So. But I think you can click a box and make it so it doesn't expire. Okay. All right. So but, it's more uh, of just like the ease of delivering it mm-hmm. and getting it off your plate. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, well, let's just uh, let's go to the final hypothetical question. Okay. I'm going to take the Wayback Studio Machine, and you're going to go back and find um, yourself when you started started all this. Okay. Maybe you were thinking about having kids or maybe you guys were just thinking about having a studio and you're going to give yourself some advice. You say, listen, Yoli, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself. Um, what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Wow. Go back and give myself. To relax. <laughs> Take it easy. Take it easy. Calm down. Um, I feel like Chris and I play off each other really well, but he tends to be like the one who's willing to take a leap and just, you know, it's going to work out. And yeah. I'm like the one putting on the brakes. Um, so I'd like to relax just yeah. a little bit more and see that it's going to be all right. Nice. All right, cool. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. It's just awesome. A lot of great stuff in here. And um, I've, I've always been fascinated by, fascinated by the business aspect of it because mm-hmm. I've, you know, basically been a one man show myself mm-hmm. and there's just so much to learn. And yeah. it's, it's amazing. I know that you don't spend a lot of time in the technicals, but it's pretty amazing how the, the puzzle solving of mm-hmm. trying to operate a, you know, what we do as a business can be just as intriguing as the puzzle solving of trying to figure out how to put a mix together. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. So um, let the rock stars know how they can find you, you online, uh, learn more about welcome to 1979. Um, what do they need to know to come to the next tape op or recording summit? Um, you can find everything you need at our website, welcome to 1979.com. Um, there's a tab on there for events and you'll find recording summit registration there. Um, it's the first weekend in November. Like I said, it's all there. 60 spots is what it's limited to. Um, we've already sold, I think 15 seats at least. Wow. So yeah, it's Way selling out advance. earlier than ever. Yeah. So um, yeah. And then yeah. maramachines.com is our Mara Machines website. Yeah. So. Rock stars. If you need a tape machine for your studio, you know where to look. Yoli, thank you so much for being on the show with us. It's been an absolute pleasure and I can't wait to see you guys around the studio. Great. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my 
free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.